Good morning. It's good to see everyone out this morning. Receive from the Lord and his word and sacrament for us. If you have the bulletin announcement sheet, ask you to please turn to that. Um, as we can see today, following the service, the second service, we have an altar circle meeting. Uh, that, again, is open to anybody that might be interested. We will be meeting in the sacristy. Now, you say sacristy, that's kind of a different word. Well, if you go through this tunnel, I guess, if you will, at the end of the dark tunnel, there is an office back there, and that's where we meet for getting things set up for uh, the pyramids and the elements up front and so forth. And uh, the sacristy meeting will be back there today uh, to talk about getting things organized for the upcoming months here for the church. LYF is also meeting, speaking of meetings, in the fellowship hall, and that'll be an LYF meeting following the service as well. It says on Monday, Pastor Richard on vacation, uh, brief change to let you guys know, I'm shooting to take Saturdays off instead of Mondays, but since the uh, kiddos are out of school tomorrow, I'll be taking tomorrow off with the kids, so that's the reason why that says it that way, so keep that in mind. But then on Tuesday, we're back to men's Bible study at 645, and then it says Matins Service, Winkle, uh, that is going to be the monthly circuit meeting. All the churches that we're a part of in our region are called a circuit, and we get together once a month to talk about the different business of the churches, and those meetings are called Winkles. Now, Winkle is a German word which means in a corner, or a meeting in a corner, and so we still use that old German word for that. Now, with that said, we will be having meetings on Tuesday, but there's a church service at 10 a.m., and that is a matin service, uh, singing the prayers from the hymnals, so that is at 10 o'clock. That's open to anyone that might be interested to come. Ladies' Bible study as well on Tuesday, and then we look through the rest of the week, quilting, women's Bible study, and uh, so forth. There's some other information on the back of the bulletin as well. Monthly trustee meetings uh, have been moved to Sundays. Uh, the Sundays, um, right, so be the next trustee meeting will be February 7th, excuse me. And we have a quarterly voters meeting on January 31st, so keep that in mind uh, for a quarterly voters meeting in the fellowship hall coming forward. Is there anything else that I may have missed? I believe it is mites collection for LWML. I, the first service they were collecting mites, so I'm assuming, yep, it'll be for today as well. So thank you for mentioning that. Any other announcements that I may have overlooked? Well, today is Epiphany 2. We hear about the miracle in Cana when Jesus turns that water to wine. But we also have an epistle reading from the epistle of Romans, the 12th chapter. And there's a segment in there where, where Paul talks about loving thy enemy, one's enemy. We're going to hear more about that in the sermon here today. But before we do so, our opening hymn of invocation is hymn number 644. Hymn number 644.
Ask the congregation to please stand as we turn to the top of page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Love in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all of my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by the virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I ask you to please turn to the intro, it printed on the, on the inside of your bulletin, sung to the tune of C. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name, give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of men. Blessed be God. Because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all of our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after the Epiphany is from Exodus chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, See you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, Please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct? I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Romans chapter 12. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The gospel is from St. John, the second chapter. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. 
Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. With one heart and one voice, we confess the holy faith as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed on 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being a one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 408, hymn number 408. In the name of Jesus, amen. Congregation may be seated. We are picky. Yes, we are picky. We're also choosy. 
We're picky and choosy when it comes to extending love to those around us. For example, it is easy to love someone that loves us in the first place. It is also easy to love someone that gives us good things. So it makes sense that you can find a lot of love in a church. Yes, in a church. Christians possess in a church the same faith. And when they possess that same faith, they often become a loving church family. Yes, a loving church family where Christians try to put each other first. It's actually not uncommon within the church to see Christians trying to play second fiddle, as they say. Yes, second fiddle, lifting each other up as if there's some sort of competition to see who can outdo each other in showing honor to one another. Like it has already been stated, yes, as it has already been stated, it is easy to love someone that loves us in the first place. It is easy to love someone that gives us good things. However, what about loving those who do not give us good things? How about loving those who perhaps persecute us? Yes, those outside the church, those who are against the church. How about loving those people? Well, in Romans 12 this morning, we hear from the Apostle Paul in our epistle reading from today. And he tells you and he tells me not only to love Christians inside the church, but then he directs you and me to love those outside the church, to love and to pray and to bless those who are our enemies. Yes, he calls you and me to love our enemies, to love those who persecute and hurt us. Now, just to make sure we are clear with who our enemies are, it is important to understand the original audience that Paul was writing to in our epistle from Romans. Paul was writing to Christians in the city of Rome some 2,000 years ago. And these Roman Christians, well, they had a government that would often suppress unofficial religions like Christianity. That's to say, the Roman Christians, those Christians in Rome, would often experience prejudice and unfair treatment by the Roman state. During that first century, Christians were banished by the state and even executed for their faith. We all know the story, or maybe perhaps heard the story of that Emperor Nero setting Yes, setting the city of Rome ablaze with light, with burning Christians on cruci- crucified on crosses. And so Paul is telling the Christians in Rome, yes, in Rome, to not only put up with that Roman state, but to love the oppressive Roman rulers. Yes, to love oppressive Roman rulers. For example, if a magistrate spoke poorly about the Christian faith, well, that magistrate... He deserves love from a Christian. If a ruler harasses a Christian and throws them in jail, well, Christians are to bless the ruler, to pray to God on behalf of that ruler. Now, does this mean that we Christians are to be a bunch of wimpy and powerless doormats letting everyone walk all over us? No, by no means. By no means, my friend. This reading, these readings from the Epistle of Romans, the 12th chapter, is not condemning self-defense or telling us that we should not be as wise as a serpent with respect to our enemies. Loving and blessing an enemy is not the same as being an ignorant, foolish doormat, allowing ongoing abuse and violence upon oneself. Furthermore, loving and blessing an enemy is not the same as agreeing with an enemy. To love an enemy is not the same as endorsing their actions or endorsing their agenda or agreeing with their ideology. Now, I don't have to tell you that we have really messed this all up. We have really messed all this up in America right now. Sure, we are good at loving those who are part of our own political tribe. That is for sure. However, perhaps the greatest sin, according to our culture, right now, is to show love to one's enemy. It is viewed as an act of betrayal or an endorsement of an enemy. We certainly do not have much mercy for those who are different from us right now, no doubt about it. Right now in America, we are messing this up badly. But no matter how much persecution arises from our enemies... No matter how unbearable the heights of the persecution, we must never stop wishing our enemies wellness. We must never stop loving 
our enemies. Hear this loud and clear. Right now, open your ears. Hear this loud and clear. We understand that love is showing kindness to those who are our friends. And we understand that love is often expressed by not returning an evil action to those who have done evil to us. However, this is not all that the Apostle Paul has to share about love for us today. It is not all what Jesus has to say about love either. God's Word tells us that we are to love and bless our enemies, to pray for our enemies, and to wish them happiness. Now, if you are like me, you must confess right now that this does not feel right It doesn't feel right. You see, I find it easy to love my friends. It is, indeed. It is easy to love those who give things to you. It is easy to love those friends. It is also easy to show love to a certain extent by not getting even with an enemy. There's a certain amount of willpower you can have to hold back retribution towards an enemy. But to love and to bless my enemy, my friends, my sinful old Adam cannot stand this idea. I hate this idea. Deep down, my old Adam, this sinful nature, and get this, your sinful nature as well, this old Adam wants destruction of our enemies. We want the damnation of our enemies. You see, anger comes about, and it gets the best of us, and we rage with bitterness towards our enemies. We, even, we can even envision... We can envision their destruction as they're taken apart in a thousand pieces. Who doesn't like to watch a movie, a good old movie, where the villain gets what's coming to him? You see, when enemies get what are when enemies get what is coming for them, wow, we chuckle with sinful delight. We are happy when our enemies are destroyed. But why? Well, dear friends. We like to draw a line between good and evil. Now, please hear me loud and clear here. There's indeed a difference between good and evil. Yes, there's indeed a difference between good and evil. There's a line between good and evil. They cannot mix. Evil is not good and good is not evil. However, to the point, we like to draw lines through all sorts of things to distinguish good and evil according to our desires. For example, we draw a line between countries. Well, we say this country over here is good and this country over here is evil. We like to draw lines between political parties. Well, this party over here is evil and this party, well, this party is good. We draw a line between economic classes. Those making a certain amount of money, well, they are evil. And those making this amount of money, they are good. We draw a line between ethnicities and gender and generations, classifying certain genders and races and generations as good and others as evil. And after we draw all these lines through all these different categories, we then do this. We show love to the side that is most like us. And we begin to hate those who are on that other side of that line. Yes, we draw that line, those on that other side, well, we start to show them hate. After all, they're obviously evil. While this is problematic, indeed, while this is problematic, the real problem with this kind of thinking is that when we place a line between all these different classifications, we begin to see the other people on the other side of the line as less human. After all, they are supposedly evil. And as we see them as less human, as we have that line, we see them as less human on that side, we then feel justified, we feel right and okay in our hate and their destruction. And so instead of praying for them, praying for others on the other side of the line, we spend our time marinating in hate, marinating in hate and dreaming of their destruction. We place them, get this outside of God's category of creation making them into mere animals. We place them outside the grace of Christ, as if Christ's arms did not stretch wide enough for their redemption. This kind of line drawing, my friends, frankly stated, yes, frankly stated, is demonic. You heard that correctly. It is demonic. Now, dear friends, hear this loud and clear again. 
The line separating good and evil does not pass through countries. It does not pass through political parties. It does not pass through economic classes and ethnicities and genders and generations. No, the line passes through every human heart. It passes through this heart and these hearts as well. You see, this does not mean that part of your heart is bad and the other part is good. No, it means that your sinful nature within you is on the opposite side of good, just like everybody else. There's no difference between you and your neighbor with respect to this line. Your country, your politics, your finances, your ethnicity, your gender, and your age do not somehow push you over to the line to the side of good. Paul teaches all of us in the epistle of Romans, that not even one is good. No one is righteous, not even one. We are all together on the side of the line labeled evil. Because of this, this sinful old Adam. This is why we pray for our enemies. This is why we wish them happiness. You see, they are just like us and we like them. We know the evil in our hearts, and we want them to realize the evil in their hearts so that they and us, we might all receive forgiveness, life, and salvation together in the one righteous one, the only good one, Christ. And so when your enemy does something evil, my friends, we repent. Yes, we repent. We repent when your enemy does evil because you know that the evil they have just committed springs forth from a sinful heart, the same sinful heart that you and I have. Yes, we repent when we see evil and we pray for enemies. We cling to the forgiveness of Christ and we cry out when we see evil done, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on my neighbor. Lord, have mercy especially on my enemy. And we confess boldly, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus and set things right in this world that has gone mad. Indeed, we pray that our enemies would be delivered from their deception. We pray that they would be brought to their knees in sorrow. We pray that they would join us in confessing that we are all poor and miserable sinners in thought, word, and deed. For there is plenty of room, my friends, plenty of room before the throne of God for repentant sinners. Never forget, never forget there's always more grace in Christ than there is sin in us and our enemies combined. And so, dear baptized saints, if it is possible, if it is possible, keep peace with everyone around you while constantly praying for your enemies. However, remember that you do not keep peace at all costs. Indeed, there will be times, no doubt about it, there will be times when truth and duty and justice and integrity demand that you defend yourself and defend others. And when this happens, when you defend truth and integrity and duty and justice, stand firm, rest in Christ, and pray for those who attack you. And when you are persecuted for your faith, never forget the victory of Christ that though you were once an enemy of God, Christ Jesus made you his own through his death and resurrection. Get this erasing that line and reconciling you to the Father. Never forget that you have been forgiven for the enemy that lurks within your heart, the old Adam. And so you've been delivered from darkness to light, made friends with God through Christ. And so may our prayer be this today. May God grant you and me the humility to see ourselves no better than those around us. May God grant you and me love to serve our neighbor. May God grant you and me a posture of grace to pray and bless those around us, especially our enemies. And may God grant us the grace and the faith to know that Christ has reconciled us to the Father, that he has dealt with this enemy of the heart, forgiven it by his shed blood claiming us, redeeming us, and forgiving us. God help us. God grant us grace and peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. 
As the congregation will please stand for the offertory. Congregation may be seated for the offering music as a way to reminder the offering plate is in the back of the sanctuary. Offerings can also be mailed into the church office or conducted online through the church website. As the congregation, please stand. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, you have manifested your glory in the sign given at Cana. You have restored creation through the shedding of Christ's blood. And now give us your grace in abundance. Give us joy and gladness in the revelation of your truth, in the person of your Son. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, you blessed the wedding at Cana with your presence and honored it with your first miracle. Strengthen and give your gladness to all married couples and their families. Be present in our homes and lives with your free and abundant forgiveness. And preserve us in the true faith from each generation to the next. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, preserve in wisdom our nation and our leaders, especially Joseph, our president-elect, Kamala, our vice president-elect, Doug, our governor, and all public servants, including our armed forces, police, and first responders. Send peace in our time. Look, Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, you are the great physician of body and soul. Give rest, healing, and relief to those who are sick or in any need. We pray especially for Tim and Ashley, Butch, Carl, Charlotte, Darcy, David, Dennis, Dory, Aaron, George, Gloria, Janice, Jeff, Janice, Joellen, Justin, Lars, Levon, Marilyn, Melissa, Philip, Rita, Sue, Tim, and Tom. Be with all expectant mothers and their children. Invite them and us to cast all anxiety on you. And so live in the certainty of your steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that of your grace you have instituted holy matrimony in which you keep us from unchastity and other offenses. We beseech you to send your blessing upon every husband and wife that they may not provoke each other to anger and strife, but live peacefully together in love and godliness. Receive receive your gracious help in all temptations and rear their children in accordance with your will. 
Grant us all to walk before you in purity and holiness, to put all of our trust in you, and to lead such lives on earth, that in the world to come we may have everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we continue to the service of the sacrament, we continue in repentance and faith to receive the gifts the Lord has for us in his body and blood. If you're not a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Center, one of our sister congregations, we do still invite you to please come forward, kneel, and cross your arms to receive a blessing at the rail today. And if you'd like to partake of this wonderful gift of the altar, please talk to me after the service about membership here at St. Paul's. Also, as a way of reminder, we ask that you please space out at the rail as you receive God's gifts this day. We continue on 194. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times, at all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him, being found the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Top our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Ask the congregation to please stand as we sing the Nunc de Menace on page 199. thanks unto the Lord for he is good let us pray 
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this solitary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Congregation may be seated for the departing hymn, hymn number 507, hymn number 507. Well, my friends, we think about the scriptures and what they say, what Paul teaches us, that we are enemies of God because of our sin, but through Christ Jesus we are made friends, we are reconciled. That reconciliation is the hope of the gospel for us, it is the hope that we have for those who we would consider enemies, but ultimately need repentance just like us, to be found in Christ and his forgiveness, life, and salvation. Go in the hope of the gospel, rest in the gospel, rest in Christ. Amen.